everybody has insurance. So what in the world could that possibly have to do with racism or the broken issue y'all be talking about? And if it does, what are the factors that go into determining how much you pay for insurance anyway? Because I thought I was good if I was a driver that didn't have bad problems or if my property was in a good location. And even if the underlying factors are problematic, what in the world am I supposed to do about it? Well, I'm glad you asked because we are talking about it after the break. Brokers, welcome to another episode of Brokers, where we talk about the unbelievable fish this country has done to keep us broke. Now, here are your hosts, Amber and Erica. Hey, everybody. I am Amber. And I'm Erica. And today on Brokers, y'all, we are talking about insurance, implicit bias, and racism. Yes, I know. Is this going to be boring, Amber? Like, am I gonna boring? But I feel like people are probably exhausted. Like, y'all can't really be finding racism in all the things, okay? Not Geico, not progressive, not State Farm. But yes, yes, that is the whole point of this podcast is to show y'all that the broken ish is all around us. And even in the things that seem mundane, and even in the things that seem relatively innocuous, like buying insurance, is saddled and tainted by the pollution and the poison of racism. And that is what we are talking about today. We have a special guest with us to help us to unpack how not only the delivery of insurance services, but the pricing of insurance services, the handling of insurance claims can all be impacted by being black in America. And just like all of the things around us, we are disproportionately affected by the inequitable outcome whether it be pricing, whether it be how our claims are handled, whether it be how our properties are valued. And so we are unpacking it today, obviously, because y'all need to know, but also because we need to be able to advocate for ourselves and stand up when we recognize that what is happening to us has nothing to do with the validity of our claim or the product that we are seeking, but everything to do with the color of our skin and how we show up in this racist ass country. So I am so happy. And now that that Amber has given everybody (laughs) 30 minutes of an introduction (laughs) and hasn't gotten to the introduction. Um, (laughs) Amber, you do know that the... You do know that the first part of the show, you don't have to like tell everything, right? We're going to get into it slowly. Like you got to let the people warm up, right? We're well, you the one that with- said that they was going to be bored. So I just wanted to let people know that it's not boring. It's not. Okay. Mm. I'm, I'm just, you know, we're supposed to open up the, the warm opener, right? We're supposed to be like, oh, hey, Amber, what have you been doing lately? And Amber already got into all the stuff. Mm-mm. I'm going to ask you what you're doing, but I just need to let them know. And maybe maybe I have a soft spot in my heart for this because I am an insurance lawyer. And I think most of y'all know that already. But, you know, I'm probably a little wound up today because I'll be seeing this stuff all the time. Apparently. So before, Amber, we actually get to our guest and his introduction, dear. Um, <laughs> what have you been up to, ma'am? You know... I call myself taking a little time off for the holidays. I'm not entirely sure how successful that's been. But, um, you know, I've been having a a good time. One of my one of my line sisters came to visit me for the last few days um, from New York. And so I I got a little break. I got some girlfriend time. We stayed in a hotel. So I got away from these bad ass kids. What? So, you know, I know. So I, I guess, you know, I really can't complain. Real talk. I can't complain. Yeah. Well, that's good. So it sounds like your 2023 yeah. is off to a good start. Yes. How is your so, 2023? Well, good. I actually was scrolling on Facebook the other day, Amber. And guess what I saw? I saw my friend Amber with the post about how she basically almost died in 2022 because of you know overworking and not taking care of herself and I just feel like she might be taking the same habits into 2023 and I just came here to say Amber don't do it okay uh it's hard to find a (laughs) co-host so (laughs) I need you to take better care of yourself in 2023 okay please you know because 
again, when you talked about in your post about how you almost died and you kept working, you kept working. I didn't read the part about how you said my friend Erica told me to stop. My friend Erica said, don't do it. My friend Erica said, F that job. And she you did. kept working. She did. So. Now that is true. And and when I when she found out I was going to work the day after I got out of the hospital, she did. She cussed me out real good, told me I needed to keep my ass in the bed. That is that's a hundred grand true. And I it took me a few months, but the seeds, the seeds of them good words have been watered and they are now yielding a harvest. Hallelujah. So I'm 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 trying. I'm trying to do it different. Okay. Well, in 2023, we're hoping for new things. So act accordingly. Amen. Okay. Amen. Now, Amber, on to the introduction of our guest. So we have a very special guest with us today um, for a variety of reasons. You know, we have somebody who is um, a consumer advocate, you know, who has a career dedicated to advocating for the people. But also, you guys know that Broke-ish is a space where we normally center Black people, Black women. And so it is very nice with, to have with us today a guest who is different from us, a white man, but who is very much involved in equity work to remind us that this work is all of ours, that liberation and equality and justice is a group project. It doesn't matter where you're situated in this world. And so we are very happy to have with us today Michael DeLong of the Consumer Federation of America. Um, and so Michael joined the Consumer Federation of America in April 2020 as the Research and Advocacy Associate for CFA's Campaign for Fair Auto Insurance. And in this role, he conducts research on auto insurance and advocates for better, fairer, and more affordable practices that will protect all consumers. And he is particularly focused on combating discrimination in insurance markets. Before joining CFA, Michael worked as a healthcare and antitrust advocate where he organized consumer opposition to harmful mergers. I love that, by the way. And he also served as a legislative assistant for two Maryland state delegates. Um, Michael graduated from Reed College in 2012 with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. And so Thank you so much today for being here with us, Michael. We appreciate your time and we appreciate you coming on to the podcast to talk to us about insurance work. Sure. Uh, glad to be here. And thank you so much for having me. No problem. No problem. So I've read the official bio, uh, but we do kind of like to be, and I say we loosely, it's usually mostly Erica. <laughs> we like to sort of be a little messy, get in people's business. So we have the official story, but tell us a little bit about you and where you're from and how you came to start doing consumer advocacy work. Sure. Um, I grew up in California, uh, in uh, Berkeley and Lafayette, a suburban town to the east of Berkeley. I uh, lived there for most of my life until I went off to college. Uh, I went to Reed College, a small liberal arts school in Portland, Oregon. Uh, was very interested in politics and government to the point where I would sometimes annoy people by talking about it all the time. Uh, I graduated, uh, worked at a nonprofit, uh, came to the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, got involved in consumer protection. I first was working for an antitrust lawyer named David Balto, and we were opposing harmful health insurance mergers. And that's how I first got involved in insurance and also how I got involved in consumer protection, because I also found out there are all sorts of like consumer agencies devoted to helping consumers and trying to prevent them from being exploited and being overcharged. And uh, how well they operate can depend on a lot of things. It can depend on like the laws that are written. It can depend upon the people who are actually uh, staffing the agencies. It can depend upon outside pressure, encouraging them to do their job and standing up against corporate influence. And uh, that's how I also became new about Consumer Federation of America. And uh, I had an interview with them and joined just as COVID was shutting everything down. So my first uh, few months were entirely virtual. I didn't even come into the office, uh, which I am in right now, but I didn't even come into the office until uh, eight months on the job. And uh, it's a very good group. It's a lot of work, but there's a small staff of us and we are fighting against some very big corporate influences. But I like it, and I've learned a lot about insurance. Uh, I'm still learning quite a bit. One of the things is that insurance is complicated in some ways, but simple in others. And part of the what I've learned is that many insurance companies try to make it more complicated in order to take advantage of people and uh, 
to make them feel ashamed of their ignorance. And so I just wanted to start by saying uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you don't know about insurance. Uh, I'm still learning quite a lot, even after almost three years on the job, and I'm very glad to be here. And I also hope that this will not be boring because while there are some aspects <laughs> of insurance that can be boring, there's also a lot that can be that is really interesting. So. Absolutely. And so one of the things that I was mentioning to the brokers before you started, um, I have spent almost my entire career defending insurance companies. Um, <laughs> and so I know this work from a very different perspective than you. And so you mean the I, wrong perspective. You know it from the wrong perspective. Way to start out 2023 being judgy, sis. Okay. I'm I'm over here bearing my soul. I'm I'm letting the people know. But yes, I, I've spent my entire career doing insurance defense work, defending insurance companies um, who don't want to pay claims, uh, basically. And so one of the things that I am interested in kind of talking about today is as you look at the other side, you know, anyway, maybe that's my atoning. I, I won't, before we go there, let me just start this way. Basically, kind of let's just talk about what insurance is. What is insurance and, and why do we have it? Like just as a sort of societal value, why do we value the concept of insuring things and insuring places? Sure, yeah. Insurance is actually quite important and essentially it's kind of a safeguard uh, against risk. The basic concept is that if you've got something big to lose, like say your car because you get into an accident or your home because you run into, you experience like a wildfire or damage from a storm and you can't afford to pay for the loss yourself, um, you pay for insurance. The idea is that basically if something does go wrong, the insurance company, they're going to pay for whatever you need to make your life like it was before uh, the experience. And so uh, when you buy an insurance policy, uh, like say on your car, every month you make a payment to your insurance company, uh, that's called a premium. And in exchange for these premiums, uh, the insurance company, they agree to pay you for losses if they occur, like if say there is an auto accident that you're involved in. And uh, they spread out the risk. The insurance company has, the idea is that the insurance company is gonna have a lot of policyholders and uh, most, the vast majority of them are gonna pay their premiums, but they're not going to experience say like auto accidents or storms that damage their home. Uh, and so there's always some risk that that could happen, but by spreading the risk around, um, you protect everybody and uh, you ensure that if say someone does get like a lot of damage to their car and they need to be replaced, uh, normally on their salary, they couldn't do that, but the insurance company will pay you a significant amount of money uh, so you can do that. And so everyone benefits, uh, society benefits, and uh, people are protected against the risk of something catastrophic happening. And yeah. that is, that's the theory. Uh, in practice, it's a bit more complicated, but it's a very sound concept and it's actually essential for how a lot of our society and economy works. So Michael, as you think about sort of, or do people who work in the insurance industry by large, do they understand sort of the history of, in this country of always wanting to protect assets and how, you know, a lot of that initially was insurance companies insuring their enslaved people, right? Like, so many of the insurance companies that we know that are in existence today were in existence hundreds of years ago and had actual humans on their books. Is that something that you think people in general know, or is that not some, is that like a dirty secret of the industry? Um, in the industry, I'd say maybe don't quote me on this, but like half people of the people know about it. More people know about uh, insurance and the history of slavery and racism than in the than the past. In the past, like many years ago, my colleague Doug Heller, who's been working on insurance for since the late 1990s, he would uh, talk about this, and people would be struck, would be thunderstruck, to be like. I had no idea this even happened. In recent years, there's been more awareness among uh, insurance executives and employees, and there's been some efforts to try and uh, reduce uh, discrimination, uh, but the emphasis on some and only in certain areas. Uh, but among the broader public, I think that most people honestly don't have, don't have a clue. 
insurance is an interesting topic because it's very important, but also uh, it's not super uh, – most people don't think about it until you need it. And so you sign the policy, which unfortunately a lot of people don't read and uh, don't really understand. And then – but if you get involved in an accident or damage happens to your home, then only then do many people realize, oh, this is covered under my policy. This is not. This is what I have to do. And um, insurance – it's also not helped by the fact that insurance is mostly regulated at the state level. So you've got 51 uh, state insurance commissioners, the states plus the District of Columbia, and they're in charge of uh, making sure that consumers are protected and that uh, insurance rates aren't excessive or any that consumers don't experience unfair discrimination. And some of them, as we'll talk about later, do their job much better than others. Yeah, so, so it's interesting that you go straight into sort of the state regulation from the connection Erica drew er earlier about the history of insuring and profiting off of enslaved bodies. Because when you were talking about why we have insurance and kind of why we spread risk around, that all seemed very race neutral in general, just sort of the concept of mitigating risk, spreading risk around. But when we interrogate that more and look into how insurance is priced or how we come up with the ways that the risk is spread in terms of who is apportioned what, talk about some of the factors that go into that, that a lot of people might not know about. That is sort of that straight line back to the insuring of enslaved people that Erica was talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, well, the essence of insurance is trying to figure out risk, how risky someone is to insure, like, for instance, how likely they are to be involved in uh, an auto accident, how likely their home is to get damaged. But there's a lot of factors that can go into, like, what exactly makes someone risky to insure? And that can be influenced by racism in our society, unfortunately. And one of the things that we've come across is that insurance companies – use a lot of socioeconomic factors to determine if people are supposedly risky and to charge them higher premiums. Uh, most of my work on this, it's been in auto insurance. Uh, in auto insurance, there are a lot of different factors, and we think that the main factors that should be considered are your driving record, like how well you drive, uh, your claims history, uh, possibly a couple of other, what kind of car you have, but uh, auto insurance companies look at many other factors as well, which results in a lot of unfair discrimination. For example, they look at your credit score, whether you've got excellent credit, whether you've got fair credit, whether you've got poor credit. Um, they look also at your job title, whether you're working at a high paying job or a low Do paying they? job. Yes. I never, I never knew job title was a part of this calculation. Well, they have different ways of finding it out. But when you go online and go fill in the information to like get your a quote, you'll see that they ask for a whole bunch of inf information and things. And often one of the things they ask for, or at least ask for other data points that they can use to then find out is your uh, what kind of job or what where you work. Um, among other things, they look at whether you've graduated from high school or college or gotten a master's degree. Um, they look also at whether you're married. Uh, your gender, uh, your zip code or neighborhood, sometimes whether you own your home or whether you rent your home. And all of these qualities factor into your auto insurance. And also we found they fa many of them factor into your homeowner's insurance as well. And uh, the effects are actually quite harmful. Um, and I could talk about this all day. So let me know if I'm going on at too much great length. But basically when we found that when you have poor credit, uh, you, even if you're, you can get charged a lot more for auto insurance. We've done research, other companies have done research as well, and we found that uh, comparing two drivers, both of which have perfect driving records, the driver with excellent credit will pay on average maybe, say, $600 annually for auto insurance. But if you take that same driver with a perfect driving record but poor credit, they'll be paying around $1,200 for auto insurance. So you're going to be paying twice as much for auto insurance just because of your credit, irrespective of like your driving record, because you've got no tickets, no crashes, no claims filed. And we found similar things in other areas. Like we found that auto insurers tend to charge people more if you graduated from high school compared to if you graduated from college. And uh, paradoxically, people who work in lower paying jobs, like say as a cashier or a retail worker, they will often get charged more than people who work in higher paying jobs, like being a doctor or a lawyer. 
And we found even more examples of discrimination. Uh, contrary to the popular stereotype, women often pay more for auto insurance than men. It varies sometimes. There are some auto insurers that charge women more. Uh, there are a few auto insurers that charge men and women equally, and there are a couple that actually charge men more. And in homeowners insurance, we see similar results. People with poor credit have to pay higher premiums. And one of the things I wanted to push back strongly on is that insurance companies like to claim that people with, uh, for example, poor credit are irresponsible and they just don't want to pay their bills on time. And so they're risky. But a close study is going to realize that's complete nonsense. People can have bad credit for a lot of different reasons. Yep. Someone might have grown up in, like, say, a low-income household and not had easy access to credit. Um, they might be frugal and not make big purchases, and yet they get, can get dinged for that. Uh, or their savings might have been drained by circumstances beyond their control, like if they had a big medical crisis and they struggled to pay their bills. Or they could have lost their job and struggled to pay their bills through no fault of their own, like if there was a recession or a depression and they lost their job. In fact, that happened to a lot of people during the COVID-19 pandemic when uh, lots of people lost their jobs and had to struggle to pay their bills. And that's going to impact that is going to impact their credit. In fact, in some cases, it already has. So, so. Michael, quick question about um, you, you mentioned before, right? Risk insurance is all about risk. And how do we spread that around? But when you think about risk and you think about these factors that probably don't have anything to do with your driving record, are there folks doing studies? And what do the studies say about how your credit score, what it actually means in terms of your riskiness? Are these people actually more risky or is it just that this is something that the insurance companies have done and they continue to do it? Well, it's hard to say for sure, because one of the things you're going to run into is there's a lack of good information on this. But basically... Uh, in my opinion, no. People with poor credit are not more risky than people with excellent credit. Uh, insurance companies like to claim that people with poor credit are more risky to insure. But when we've actually said, okay, you say this, can we see information? Can we see like your actual studies and information that uh, people with poor credit are like more likely to get into an auto accident? They clam up and they're like, oh, well, this is a trade secret. We can't really provide it. And they occasionally provide some studies, but they're their surface level and not very convincing. So we think this is more of an excuse. One of the things that we think is going on is that auto insurers uh, and uh, homeowners insurers, they are favoring wealthier consumers at the expense of poorer consumers. Uh, not all- Not in America. We don't do that in America. I know, Stop. shocking, right? But uh, not all consumers are equal, unfortunately. And this is one of the things CFA is trying to fix. But auto insurers, for example, have specific consumers that they really like and favor. And these are wealthier consumers with more disposable income that they want to attract. And the idea is that since these people have disposable income, they will buy not just an auto insurance policy, but a homeowner's insurance policy and possibly a life insurance policy. And if they are even wealthy enough and own a boat, perhaps even like a boat insurance policy. And so the companies figure that it's worth giving them a discount uh, on this auto insurance policy if we can get all the other policies and thereby make more money, attract them, and benefit ourselves. By contrast, if you've got uh, someone who is lower income and is only going to buy an auto insurance policy, they may actually look at you and think this person is actually less desirable as like one of our customers, and so we're going to charge them more. So, and these effects, this impact and the use of these factors has a disproportionate impact on black consumers because, because of past and present discrimination, black consumers uh, tend to have less access to credit. Uh, credit scores are on average lower for a lot of folks and um, uh, education levels tend to be lower. And so all these factors, which at first glance might seem to be neutral, in fact, they wind up disproportionately hurting black consumers and so they have to pay more. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the ways that insurance companies intentionally mine zip code data to um, bill auto insurance and how zip codes that tend to have higher populations of black and brown people are also places where they tend to charge more money for insurance products. Yep. One of the other factors that auto insurers and homeowners insurance companies actually use is uh, your zip code. Um, they look at your neighborhood and they uh, charge you my higher auto insurance premiums or lower auto insurance premiums, depending on the place where you live. 
and Consumer Federation of America did studies. So have other reports, uh, other groups like Consumer Reports, and they found that uh, people living in mostly black neighborhoods and zip codes pay dramatically higher for auto insurance. And Amber, you found actually one of our reports from 2015, which is uh, quite insightful. And we found basically that in uh, communities where over 75% of the residents are black, uh, your auto insurance premium is on average 70% higher compared to a place where uh, less than one quarter of residents are black. And this applies across the board. We found similar results in rural areas when you look at rural zip codes, mostly white zip codes, most just mostly black zip codes uh, in urban areas. And to a certain extent, there is probably there should be some variation of premiums like in uh, zip codes, like if, say, some place is considerably denser, it would make might make more sense for your premium to be a little bit higher because there is a bit more risk that you might get into an accident, like a fender bender or something like that. But we're seeing evidence of dramatic discrimination, people getting charged like 50, 60, 100 percent more, even sometimes like 150 or 200 percent more uh, based on their zip code. And that is not remotely justifiable. Um, the auto insurers, one of the things they pr claim is that, well, this place may be more vulnerable because it has higher rates of a street crime. And even after con trying to control for that, you still find that the premiums are way, way excessive. So, oh, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking, and it's so fascinating because you hear all of these studies about how in neighborhoods where usually like that 60, 65 percent black, then that's when your property values are going way down. Right. Your home appraisals are less. And I'm thinking, so now you live in a black neighborhood, your house gets appraised for less and then you're paying twice as much to insure this house uh, just because it's a black neighborhood. And it's like everything just come like just piles on. Yes. And actually, when it comes to homeowners insurance, we haven't done as much work there, but we've still found some fascinating things and we're expanding our work to look more at discrimination there. Uh, we found that for one, uh, appraisals tend to be incredibly biased and there's full of racism. And they're like, apparently, I think one of the whitest professions in the United States, something like over 90% of appraisers are uh, white. And there's been glaring uh, cases where someone's house will get appraised if that, when the appraiser thinks it's the house of, say, a black couple. And it will be at appraised for like half a million dollars below what it gets appraised if they think a white couple owns this house. And with regard to homeowners insurance, we've also found many examples of unfair discrimination there. Uh, for example, uh, insurance companies will charge more to, uh, say, for instance, cover a, a house that is like over a certain that is like relatively old, like, say, from before 1970, which, again, seems to make sense because an older house often needs more maintenance. It often have, may have some issues. But since black consumers and black homeowners tend to disproportionately live in houses that are older, that winds up affecting them more. And they may also, black consumers may also just get offered worse products. Like there have been actually a couple of cases in the past where, and it's actually some lawsuits where uh, agents have been instructed, this neighborhood is mostly black. Uh, you should only offer them policies that are more expensive and offer less uh, benefits and that are just overall less desirable. And there was actually a big case about this many years ago. Uh, it was uh, housing opportunities made equal versus nationwide. They looked at a homeowner's insurance in and around Richmond, Virginia, and found dramatic evidence of redlining. And as a result, the jury required them to pay a substantial settlement, which got knocked down, but Nationwide still had to pay a substantial amount of money uh, to black consumers. So, And I think actually Tim Kaine was one of the lead lawyers on that, uh, he was. that case. So. Yeah, Amber, were you working was. for Nationwide at the time? No. So <laughs> Nationwide is one of just a couple I haven't worked for, but I have, I think I've worked for four of the seven largest carriers. <laughs> Terrible, okay. terrible. But it's it's very interesting because one of the things that we really want to help people see here on Brokish is how these things relate to each other. <laughs> how as we talk about redlining or as we talk about over policing or as we talk about disparities in education or property values, all of those things are interconnected. You know, there's never one place where we are looking at an isolated incident 
of discrimination that doesn't impact another area of somebody's life. And so I want to talk about um, particularly the State Farm litigation that's pending now and some of the impacts that it's having on Black consumers who are insured by State Farm and kind of what that has meant for their property values, their abilities to keep their homes up in the face of denied claims. So tell the brokers a little bit about what's going on with the current State Farm litigation um, so we can kind of get a snapshot of what happens when all of this stuff converges together yeah. on top of people. Sure. Um, first off, full disclosure, I am actually not a lawyer or a legal expert. I'm an insurance expert, but uh, I've been following this case actually for and information for the past several months. Um, we need a little bit of background. Uh, all the way back in March 2022, the New York Times ran uh, its first article on State Farm and racial discrimination. Um, a lot of their policyholders had been encountering obstacles to getting their claims paid out. There had been numerous examples of Black policyholders saying, my claim keeps getting denied, even though it's legitimate, or I'm having to jump through many different hoops to get this uh, fixed to a ridiculous extent. And uh, at first, we just had anecdotes. But then uh, there was this woman, Dr. Carla Campbell Jackson. She worked for State Farm. She worked actually for the Special Investigations Unit, where uh, they looked at claims that have been flagged for fraud and that are being reviewed closely. Um, she said that executives wanted her and other investigators to meet with these claims adjusters and flag more claims for investigation and deny as many of them as possible. And also, they wanted to focus, deny a lot of claims from inner city neighborhoods that were mostly black. The executives made racist statements saying, oh, of course, these claims are naturally at highest risk for fraud. So they wanted to deny legitimate payments to black consumers. And when she said no and refused and tried to call attention to this, they fired her in retaliation. And there's been actually a bunch of lawsuits filed against State Farm, but the most recent one was filed on December 14th. Uh, it was filed against State Farm, one of their affiliates in the Northern District of Illinois, seeking a class action status. And what they have basically said is that there's a lot of racism and racial inequities in the homeowners insurance market, ranging from how their sol policies are sold to how clients are treated, to how uh, the claims process is being uh, operated on. And uh, basically, that State Farm throws up all sorts of barriers to Black policyholders getting their claims paid out, and it hurts their ability to own and maintain their homes. And uh, one of the interesting things about this study, about this lawsuit, sorry, is that they actually have a study from the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law at the New York University School of Law. And we've had abundant anecdotes of racism and uh, racial discrimination, but now we actually have some like br broader analysis because uh, the New York University School of Law, they looked at 800 State Farm homeowners insurance policyholders, about 650 of them white and 150 black, and they found that black policyholders experience a lot more delays during the claims process. Um, and State Farm actually uses algorithms in the claims handling process that is that are biased against black policyholders. And among other things, they found that white policyholders, they're a lot more likely to have their claim resolved in less than a month. Uh, black policyholders need to have more interactions with the insurance companies to get their claim processed and to get it through. They've had to submit more paperwork. And in extreme cases, there's actually been uh, cases where you've got black men and women who their houses are damaged, the roof is leaking, but State Farm is saying this evidence isn't enough. You need to submit another round of paperwork. And meanwhile, the house is leaking, the roof is deteriorating even further, and they either have to pay out of pocket or uh, go without, go without basically uh, a good place to live. And we hope, we think it's encouraging that consumers are resorting to the courts to try and do this because if there's extreme injustice, then they have very good cases and they should get prompt restitution. I would also like to point out that uh, when an insurance company does these efforts to deny or delay claims, that is actually illegal. Insurance companies are required to investigate claims determine if and carefully examine them to determine if they're legitimate or if they're fraudulent. But if they are legitimate, insurance companies are supposed to promptly pay them and not engage in any uh, delaying tactics or excessive paperwork or anything else. And one of the things that S Consumer Federation of America has been doing is in recent years is pushing state insurance departments to better protect consumers, to actually crack down on insurer abuse, to ensure that claims are processed promptly and without delay 
uh, to ban the use of these socioeconomic factors that results in unfair discrimination. And some insurance companies are more devoted to their jobs than others. Uh, for example, can we name names, Michael? Can you can we uh, talk about who the good who the good guys are, if you can call it yeah. that, and who the bad guys yeah. are? Yes, with the understanding that no insurance company, no, sorry, no insurance department is perfect, and that even the best ones, there's still considerable room for improvement. Uh, California Insurance Department, they actually have uh, some of the best consumer protections because back in the 1980s they passed this proposition, Proposition 103, that among other things says that your insurance policy has to be based on legitimate factors. For example, your auto insurance policy has to be based almost entirely on your driving record. And there's a very stringent requirements for any other factors to be considered. They have to be approved by the commissioner. The consumer groups have to participate in this process and can offer feedback. And uh, basically, there's a lot of consumer protections, which has resulted in auto insurance premiums being lower than they otherwise would be. And it's helped consumers a lot. Uh, other, other insurance departments that do well, there's uh, Massachusetts and Hawaii, both of which have banned the use of credit scores in auto insurance. Um, there is the Colorado Division of Insurance, uh, which recently passed a, a law last year, uh, actually in 2021, this law bans unfair discrimination in data models, information, and algorithms uh, that uh, results in harm to insurance to policyholders. And they're actually establishing a stakeholder process to look at this and to say basically, if your data or your algorithm or your insurance model results in unfair discrimination, you need to change this or you will face severe consequences. For some states that are bad, um, the New Jersey Department of Banking and Insurance, uh, for example, they, as far as I can tell, have not really done much over the last few years. There is the Louisiana Department of Insurance, where a couple of the last insur few insurance commissioners, I think two of them, have gone to jail for corruption. And there is also the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation, which, as far as I can tell, doesn't do uh, much and hasn't taken a big stance to protect consumers. And there are actually two insurance departments that don't have much ability to protect consumers at all. They're in Illinois and Wyoming. Uh, nearly every insurance department has the power to disapprove insurance rates. Like if a company comes to you and says, like, I want to increase my auto insurance premiums by this amount, you can either approve or disapprove that. And most insurance uh, departments, if the rate is really excessive, will at least try to stand up for consumers. Like if you've got an auto insurance company that says, I want to increase my auto insurance rates by 45%. So these people will all get charged 45% more. The, uh, the insurance department will say that is too high, submit something different. And uh, hopeful, and that will at least knock it down and protect consumers to a certain extent. But Illinois and Wyoming are the two states where the insurance department doesn't have the power to do that. So they can't actually uh, approve or disapprove insurance rates at all. And in that case, and in those places, the insurance departments don't have a lot to do aside from collect data. And Correct. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to give you all the other side of the messy coin. I'm going I'm to name some insurance companies. OK, um, like I said, I, I I've been doing this work my whole career. All state and State Farm are terrible. I'm, I'm just going to tell you. OK, I, they are terrible, um, not only from the point of view of so capturing coverage is what the process is when you are trying to make a claim like you are trying to get coverage for whatever you're going to the insurance company and saying happened like hey i have hail damage to my roof mm -hmm. this is covered because insurance is a contract right it's a contract between the insured and the insurer so you know if you have an automobile accident and you want to go get a rental car while your car is being fixed, that's something that you have coverage for in your contract. So there's two issues that come up with coverage. There's coverage for you when you have a claim, and then there's coverage for you when you make a claim, when somebody else makes a claim against you. So like, mm -hmm. if you have an accident with somebody and it's your fault, that's also the reason why you have insurance, so that the insurance can make that other person whole, right? So there's what's called first party, which is where you are making a claim on your own insurance mm -hmm. for your own stuff for insurance you pay for. And then there's third party coverage where you have insurance 
to protect you if you do something that's your fault to somebody else, mm -hmm. right? So you kind of want to make sure you're covered on both of those angles. And um, it has been my experience in this work that State Farm and Allstate usually rank as the top two that are terrible in covering claims. And now I, I work mostly on the third party side. So if you have a wreck with somebody and you injure them and they sue you, you have two types of coverage. Not only do you have coverage like for the damage that you do, but you have something called indemnity, which means that the insurance company will stand in your shoes and defend you. They will defend you and indemnify you. So they're gonna cover what you owe the person, but they're also gonna defend you in the lawsuit. And so that's what I spent my career doing, third party defense. Like when people would have a car wreck that was their fault and they would get sued, the insurance company would provide them with a lawyer and, and that was my, my job. Mm -hmm. um, now, when that kind of stuff happens, you kind of want the insurance company to be on the up and up, right? Like you want them to, if you owe the person, you want them to pay them because you, you're not trying to get sued. Like you're, you're not trying to go through that. And there are companies like State Farm, like Allstate that have whole departments that essentially are set up to fight claims that they know they owe, that they just don't want to pay in order to get more leverage against plaintiff attorneys and discourage them from suing them again in the future. And to the point you're making about departments of insurance, I mean, a lot of people don't know that they're able to make consumer complaints to the Department of Insurance if they don't like the way their claim is being handled. But the insurance company will do something like they'll accept the liability, but they'll say, oh, well, they really weren't injured that bad. So we're not going to pay them anything. Uh -huh. You know, we'll just go to court and we'll just try it, you know, and sometimes that works. But what happened, for example, and, and this was a huge case with Allstate here in Dallas a few years ago, like if you have $30,000 in coverage, right, and Allstate denies the claim that the person makes against you, and then you go to court and you get a judgment against you for $100,000, well, how much you think Allstate is going to want to pay? They're only going to want to pay the $30,000 on your policy, but they put you in that position. And so a lot of people um, find themselves with those two companies, particularly having to fight them because they don't want to pay claims that they should be paying. And a lot of times there is a disproportionate impact. And I can't say factually that it's racial, but I know for a fact that less sophisticated consumers tend to be the ones who are not fighting back against this, mm -hmm. who end up in trials because when you have people who know how insurance works or who know how to advocate and, and you get that notice that this person has filed a complaint with the Department of Insurance, well, all of a sudden their claim is handled in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so for people who don't know, a lot of times they are very vulnerable. So if you got State Farm. What you got? All state. We got it, Amber. We got Watch it. Watch out. Watch but out. He, here's the thing, and Michael, you talked about this earlier, and Amber, you're mentioning it now. There is so much complexity in in all, in essentially all areas of financial services in this nation, but specifically in insurance, there is so much complexity, and so much of it is by design, and it is the American way for these very large organizations to have departments set up as a cost of doing business to them. Mm -hmm. And us as consumers are the ones who have to carry the burden of paying for all of those things. And I just, we talked on a, on a show we just had recently about how people on an unrelated topic about propaganda and how people fall prey to propaganda mm -hmm. because it's sort of like you just sit down and you just consume what's given to you because so many other areas of your life are so complex and you're just trying to navigate and feed your family and do all of these things. And for me, it's just so sad to see the realities that people have to contend with. And Amber, you talked about you know, people who are not so sophisticated. I, I think a lot of times these people are tired, <laughs> like just yeah. having to work through and say, OK, well, how do I re how do I make sure that my policy covers this? And how do I make sure that I know what my rights are? 
And then Michael, you talk about this being handled 51 different ways. Like yeah. what? If I make a move from Texas to Florida, then I have to figure it all out again. Well, like, you won't, you won't have to figure out everything because most of the insurance departments are at least somewhat similar. They're all supposed to prevent rates from ensure rates aren't excessive and adequate or unfairly discriminatory. They tend to have some similar overlapping of policies and things. But with regard to your comments about tire, that can actually be part of the uh, auto insurer strategy if they want to delay your claim. They figure, let's make them submit a lot of paperwork. Let's delay, delay, delay until they get discouraged. And so they may give up or they may accept like a substantially lower amount than what they're actually owed. And again, that's illegal and should not be allowed. One of the other things I actually wanted to mention is that uh, some state insurance departments, as we've said before, are really committed to protecting consumers. Most of them are overworked and understaffed. There's a lot of insurance companies. There's a lot of policies. Uh, there aren't actually that many uh, state insurance department employees, and they may not have the adequate experience because insurance is complicated. And even if you know a lot about the policies at one company, the policies at another company may differ. Uh, but there's also the problem of the revolving door where uh, in high ranking uh, insurance commissioners or insurance department officials, they work there and then they leave to go get jobs either in the insurance industry as lobbyists or executives. That's a pretty obvious conflict of interest, because if you're you're like, I want to get that cushy job at Allstate or State Farm where uh, I can make a lot of money. Uh, and if I actually stand up and try to protect consumers, I may not get that job. So that's a serious problem. Um, there's been some cases where uh, people at the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies and other folks, they're former, they're who are now the lobbyists. They're they were used to be former insurance commissioners. So state, so Consumer Federation of America, we're trying to point that out. And we also realize that insurance can seem complicated and overwhelming, but we do have uh, a few uh, tips and things to hopefully make it less complicated, and that consumers can do that will help in most, if not all, situations. So. Oh, good. Tell us. What are the tips? Well, first off, uh, if you think that your insurance company is treating you badly, shop around. Don't be loyal to them. Um, one of the things that insurance companies do, especially the auto insurers, is that they try to have a cute mascots or catchy slogans to like install like brand loyalty. You know, like that Geico. Geico <laughs> that gecko that shows up in all the commercials and speaks in That's that Australian awesome. accent. <laughs> It's memorable, and it's a uh, and it's a marketing ploy. It's propaganda, basically. Geico wants you to remember the gecko and have fond associations with it, so that even if your auto insurance premium goes up, you'll still be like, "Well, I've been with Geico, and I should stay with them." Do not fall for it. It's well worth your time to go look around at both auto insurance and homeowners insurance, and you can get quotes online and compare them. Uh, I did this relatively recently. I found that I was paying one hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, for auto insurance, and I found that I and what one company could give me a better deal where I'm paying ninety dollars for auto insurance, and so that's thirty dollars saved per month, uh, three hundred and sixty dollars saved per year for just a couple of an hour or two of looking around. Uh, second, uh, if you're also being treated poorly, don't hesitate to file a complaint with your state insurance department. Uh, be specific, include like what they're doing, what you think the insurance company is doing wrong, uh, what you would like them to do. And uh, also let your insurance company know that you filed the complaint. This can sometimes light a fire under them and they can either uh, get your claim moving or they can increase the amount they're willing to pay. And at the very least, it will force them to devote resources to this. And your, your insurance department may, what they do may depend on like how willing they are to protect consumers, but it's still substantially better than nothing. Uh, third, you can advocate for uh, the banning of these socioeconomic factors, like someone's credit score, someone's education level, their job. Uh, states have a big impact because insurance is regulated at the state level, but the states can, if they want, decide to ban these factors, which would help consumers uh, reduce racism and racial discrimination in insurance and lower prices. So call up your state legislator or your state insurance uh, department or your governor or all three and say these factors are harmful and uh, they should be banned. We're happy to provide information, write testimony. We've been doing organizing efforts to try and ban these factors in places like New Jersey, Maryland, uh, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and a bunch of other states. And finally, um, 
uh, you can pressure your insurance department to be more aggressive in confronting uh, corporate insurer wrongdoing and to have stiff penalties if they're found to be engaging in unfair discrimination. For example, if there's an insurance company that has been engaging in racial discrimination, overcharging people, denying their claims, uh, any fine or punishment should be serious. It shouldn't just be a slap on the wrist. Um, this is not insurance related, but uh, you may have heard that Wells Fargo recently got hit with several big fines for, again, exploiting consumers and overcharging them and basically just being a criminal enterprise masquerading as a bank. Uh, unfortunately, this is like Wells Fargo's, I think, like fourth or fifth fine in the last a uh, couple of decades. And they, <laughs> yeah. And they keep doing this bad thing. And that's simply unacceptable. Uh, the company, the fines should be enough to like make the company change its behavior and stop exploiting consumers. Or if the company just won't do that, then it should honestly be shut down and there should be better companies in its place. So um, there's a lot more about insurance, but those are like some very useful tips that can be uh, helpful. And also, if you do have an insurance claim or policy, make sure to document everything. Uh, take pictures of, say, like your house is damaged. Keep records. Uh, keep records of your interactions with the insurance uh, company. So you can either determine if this is, is this like proceeding at a reasonable rate or are they delaying it? Because if it does come to court, uh, you can point out and say, I have had to talk to this company uh, 25 times and yet no progress has been made. So... Well, thank you. Thank you for those tips. And certainly, like you mentioned, the Wells Fargo example, it is so sad because, like I said, this is just the cost of doing business and even hefty fines for these billion dollar organizations mean nothing. And so honestly, at the end of the day, as a consumer, I do feel sort of like I just feel like I'm without options. Right. I, it's David and Goliath. And I just feel like I won't win. It can be feel a bit like that, but state insurance departments are supposed to step in and uh, make it so it is less David and Goliath and more like a lot of David's teaming up to fight Goliath. And we are working to try and change that and also make the system more fair. So, and, 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 and you guys can help spread the word, let people know about insurance, let people know that these factors are being used. Most people don't even know that, say, you can get charged more for auto insurance or homeowner's insurance based on your credit score. And when they find out, they think that's quite, that's quite unfair and it should be fixed. One quick question, if you happen to know. So as you're filling out this information for these insurers, are there things that you can just not include? Like, do you have to include them or does it just probably depend on the insurer if they require it? Um, it depends on the insurer. There may be some cases where, say, if like uh, they ask for a bunch of information that, I don't know, say like about your education level, it might be worth uh, not seeing if you can proceed without filling out that information. But one thing you should never, ever do is uh, lie on an insurance application or misrepresent because that is illegal and can get you into a lot of trouble. Uh, but yeah, insurance companies, they collect a lot of information uh, about their uh, customers and often so they can slice and dice them and unfairly discriminate. And there's actually one more thing I wanted to mention briefly. It's uh, telematics, if you're familiar with uh, them. Basically, these are when you have an app on your phone or a device plugged into your car and it transmits uh, information about your driving to the insurance company and the insurance company calculates your premium based on that information. Um, this idea could benefit consumers in that it could it's not based on your credit score or any of those socioeconomic factors uh, and it could more accurately price people and say, uh, and it could be based on your driving behavior. But there are also substantial privacy concerns, like what data is being collected? What are they using it for? How do you know that they're not using that data to unfairly discriminate against people as well? And most states don't have very good telematics regulations, but these programs are available and um, it might be worth considering them, although you also need to consider how much of your data are you willing to give up? And we're advocating for stronger regulations. There are also a couple of... Uh, a program, Telmax programs that don't collect that additional information and just charge you based on uh, your mileage, how much you drive. Uh, because uh, how much you drive, that's by far the most accurate predictor of like whether someone is likely to get into an auto accident. So if you don't drive much, it may be worth looking at one of those programs and getting a pro and enlisting in a program that charges you your premium based on uh, how much you drive. Uh, if you don't drive much, you can probably save money, and actually that would benefit you. But also, if you drive a lot, 
uh, it would actually probably increase your premium. Michael, on this one, I think I'm going to have to I'm going to have to tell the people to opt out because I just feel like black people are already so over policed and over surveilled. Mm -hmm. And I see the cute little commercials like, you know, how they whatever they call it, the little camera they can put in and, you know, they make it seem like it's really cool. And I'm like, no, I, I don't I don't want to give you access. Uh -huh. I understand your point about making the premiums less, but I'm like, mm -mm. yeah, I just can't. Yeah, I totally understand. And actually, most consumers agree with you. There was a recent poll that found that most uh, American consumers don't aren't really don't like the idea of telematics and they don't want to install a device in your car. And even for the people who did want to install a device in your car, they would say, I only want to use this if it lowers my premium by 25 percent or more. So. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us here today. The information that you've given has been very helpful and very enlightening. Um, can you tell us where people can find out more information about you, your work, and um, where we can find you either on the internet or on social media? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can find a lot more information about our work on Consumer Federation of America. Uh, Google it and our website will come up and uh, or just Google Consumer Federation of America and Insurance, and I will pop up along with my colleague, Doug Heller. Um, we have our contact information is there. We're happy to uh, offer, uh, offer information and some of our studies. Um, we're not, I, again, I'm not a legal expert or a lawyer, so can't give legal advice, but happy to try and help out however I can. And if I don't know the answer, my colleague, Doug Heller will, because he's been working on insurance for over two decades and has accumulated a vast store of knowledge. And, I'm also encouraged by the fact that more and more people are realizing that discrimination in insurance is a problem and we're starting to actually make some progress. So. Nice. Well, y'all, it's the first of the year. So we do have a little bit of real homework today. Okay. Um, y'all know that's not really my ministry, but um, the first piece of homework is we want you to go to the Consumer Federation of America's website. They have a whole list of things that consumers can do to advocate and protect themselves. So read the list, get familiar with it. And then the second thing I want you to do is the piece of advice I can give you as an insurance lawyer. If you feel like you are being charged too much, or if you have concerns about fundamental unfairness in whatever insurance product you currently have, call your insurance company and request your ISO, ISO, your insurance score, um, it's basically your insurance credit score. And so everybody has an ISO. They usually run it when you have claims, but you can request a copy of your own ISO. And if it comes back and there's nothing on it, no claims, no, you can use that to advocate for yourself and say, look, there's no reason for you to be charging me what you're charging me because as my claims history indicates, as my insurance score indicates, I am not a risky person. And it's probably just a good, practice to have a copy anyway, um, because a lot of them contain inaccurate information. And usually people don't find that out until it's an inconvenient time. So get on the Consumer Federation of America's website, get the information and get your ISO. Well, thank you for the homework, Amber and Michael. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And um, we hope we'll be seeing you in the future. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thanks. So Amber, as we talk about all the time on this show, y'all stuff is complicated and it is purposely complicated because they do want to wear us out. And I know I feel defeated, but we have to really channel that energy. And so we cannot afford to sit back and allow ourselves to continually be taken advantage of. And we see that straight line directly from the fact that historically insurance was used to insure our ancestors to the point now of all of these different systems conspiring to make sure that we have to pay more to protect the little bit that we have. So y'all protect your peace, but we do have to make sure that we're pooling our energy and our resources to direct them to the right places so that we can continue to keep ourselves safe and to not get taken advantage of. So thanks for tuning in and we look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of Brokish. All right, good people. Thanks for listening to Brokish. 
For more episodes, visit us at Brokish.com or subscribe and Brokish will get direct deposited into your favorite podcast app on the 1st and 15th. Share Brokish with your friends and join the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Music for Brokish is Come Get Some by Blank and Kit. Until next time, goodbye and good luck. They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You can play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. Let's see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today.